I'm Tony McMahon and welcome to History's Terrorists. Now, you may have seen me on TV on various history and science documentaries on discovery or history, but I have another life outside of TV documentaries and that's as a communications consultant on counter-extremism and counter-terrorism. It's a, an area of work that I've been involved in for many years and I've travelled around the world uh, in this area of activity. Now, back in the 1980s, I was something of an extremist myself. I was, in the early 1980s, I suppose a Marxist-Leninist. I was a member of a Marxist group, though I never endorsed terrorism. But I think it gave me an understanding of what radicalisation and extremism are all about. So I'm hoping to convey some of that knowledge in this series. But what I want to do is take you back in time, take you back into history, to certain key moments, to people that we may have heroised in the past or seen as uh, glamorous rebels, and ask the question, were those people actually terrorists? And I'm going to be pretty daring in who I pose that question about. So it might be Jesus and his disciples. It might be the gunpowder plotters in the early 17th century, or the anarchists who struck fear into America and Europe in the late 19th century. Today then, I'm going to look at the assassins, a medieval death cult that struck fear and terror into both the Crusaders and their opponents, the Saracens, during the Crusades of the Middle Ages. And I'm going to ask whether or not the assassins were a legitimate political and religious force or were they just medieval terrorists. Through the winding streets of Middle Eastern cities like Damascus and Jerusalem in the 12th and 13th century came mysterious figures operating in the shadows and wielding daggers under their cloaks. These inhuman figures came to be known as the Assassins. Their targets were Christian and Muslim rulers. They didn't discriminate between either, and they struck fear into their opponents. But who or what were the assassins? We're very familiar with this term that originated with this group. So who were the assassins? Well, we have to go back 1400 years to when the religion of Islam was founded by the Prophet Muhammad, a religion that expanded very quickly across North Africa and the Levant, founding a global caliphate. When the Prophet Muhammad died, the question arose, who should succeed him? Should it be the best qualified person selected by the growing Islamic community? Or should it be somebody who stood in the bloodline of the Prophet? This created a division eventually within Islam between the Sunnis and the Shias. This dispute ended in bloodshed and assassination with the majority of Muslims classifying themselves as Sunnis, whereas the Shia became the minority, concentrated mainly in what is now Iran and Iraq. There were further divisions among the Shias themselves uh, with eventually the emergence of one group, the Ismailis, who would found a huge empire, the Fatimid Empire, based in Egypt. And then within the Ismailis, another division created the Naziris. And it's from the Naziris that the assassins would emerge. It's often said that the Shiite sects were influenced greatly by other belief systems like the Jewish Kabbalah, Zoroastrianism, Manichaeism, and other religions in the region. This introduced a degree of mysticism into Muslim belief, with some arguing that the Quran, Islam's holy book, had both a surface meaning and a hidden meaning. Those who believed that the Quran had a deeper secret meaning call themselves the Batiniya, and they were influenced arguably by uh, pre-Islamic beliefs, uh, including Greek philosophy, ancient Egyptian beliefs, and their followers were called the Dai. Out of this mystical trend within Shia Islam emerged a Nizari called 
his son Isaba, and after a period of study in Egypt, he returned to Iran and gathered a band of followers around him. They captured the Alamut fortress in Delam in the year 1090 and made it their base of operation. He declared himself the Sheikh ul Jebel, translated by European chroniclers as the Old Man of the Mountain. The followers of the old man on the mountain, the Dai, were trained to become terrorists, Fedai or Fedayin, and these are the people who would become known as the assassins, allegedly fueled by the drug hashish, but as I'll say in a moment, that may have actually been an unwarranted slur. Now, the assassins targeted mainly Sunni Muslim political leaders, not Christians, who they believed were trying to stamp out their belief system within Islam. And their activities really reflect very closely what the Sikari, the Jewish zealots, who I talked about in a previous episode, had done many centuries before, carrying the dagger secretly under their cloaks and then lashing out. The difference being that the Sikari would yell and scream as they hit out at somebody, whereas the assassins were very stealthy and quiet as they approached their target. One of our main sources of information on the assassins and their very odd rituals is the Venetian explorer Marco Polo. He wrote an account of his travels while languishing in prison in what is now Italy in the late 13th century. Accounts of the assassins had already been circulating for about 150 years by this time, but Marco Polo gives arguably the most vivid description of this violent cult. Marco Polo describes how these terrorists were recruited from the surrounding areas by the Old Man of the Mountain, and when it was believed that they were good enough to become, if you want, fully-fledged initiates, they were given a sleeping draught, a, a sleeping potion. When they woke up, they then found themselves in a paradisical garden surrounded by beautiful women. As we know from modern jihadi movements like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, the offer of unrestrained fornication is still a recruitment tool used to bring people on board. The difference was that whereas ISIS and Al-Qaeda talk about uh, this sex happening in the afterlife, the assassins offered a taste of it in the here and now. The young recruits would then be sent to sleep again and he would wake in the presence of the old man of the mountain. Now, the old man of the mountain would then explain that the pleasures that had just been experienced lay ahead in the paradise after death. So, if the young adept wanted to experience that again, martyrdom should be embraced to once more enjoy those carnal delights. The hold that the old man of the mountain had over these uh, assassins, over these recruits to terrorism, uh, was, was such that it's said that he could command them to leap from a great height to certain death. But uh, we have to question whether or not the assassins really carried out their murders under the influence of hashish, and that's where the term assassin is said to derive from, hashishin. The thing is, though, if these assassins were operating in the way they would have to, strict discipline, knowing their every move, stalking their prey, were they really going to do that off their heads on marijuana? It just seems incredibly unlikely. What is far more likely is that this was used as a term of abuse by other Muslims to infer that this sect were basically made up of low-born, drug-eating scum. By the end of the 11th century, the assassins were well established, and it's at this time that the Pope declared the first of several crusades, the objective being to take Jerusalem, the holy city, back from Muslim control. It had been under Muslim control for about 400 years by this stage. But also the Christian Byzantine Empire, which roughly covers what's now modern Turkey and the Balkans, was under threat from a new group of people called the Seljuk Turks, who had swept down into the Middle East from the Russian steppes. In 1099, a crusader army took Jerusalem under Prince Tancred, and also other Christian states were established 
all along the eastern Mediterranean coastline in what is now essentially southern Turkey, Lebanon, Israel and Jordan. New orders of Christian knights arose that lived by a monastic rule, and that included, of course, the Knights Templar, who were founded in 1118. And there is a theory, an intriguing theory, that the Templars were set up by crusaders who had observed the operations of the assassins and wanted to emulate its structure and ethos. For the assassins and their first leader, Hassani Saba, the first old man of the mountain, the Seljuk Turks were the immediate enemy. They had swept down, as I said, from the Russian steppes. They were now pouring into the Middle East. And so the assassins went to war against the Seljuks, using a combination of conventional warfare, but also the deadly weapon of assassination. Dedicated, single-minded killers were sent out by Hassan Isaba to murder kings, princes, generals and governors. This was a concerted series of terror attacks against the Seljuks. If I was making a modern-day comparison, I think of the way in which Vladimir Putin sends out agents to carry out poison attacks on opponents in foreign cities, or, for example, the assassinations that have been carried out by the North Koreans. It's, as it were, an auxiliary form of warfare to conventional warfare and military attacks. So most victims of the assassins then were Seljuk Turks, and the chroniclers who really detested the assassins were mainly Muslim. They inferred that the assassins, uh, the Nazaris as well, weren't genuinely Muslim. Uh, They even said things like that there were loads of Jewish converts in there, and even Christian converts, uh, and that this wasn't truly Muslim behaviour. The hatred felt by Muslims towards the assassins wasn't lost on the Crusaders. And in fact, on occasion, they would actually work with the assassins, even fight alongside them against the common enemy. This was a case of using any means at their disposal to hold on to their new kingdoms. But in 1152, the assassins struck at their first Christian target, Raymond II, Prince of Tripoli. 40 years after the assassination of Raymond by the assassins, an even more daring attack on Christians. A group of assassins disguised themselves as monks. They somehow won the confidence of the Bishop of Tyre and ingratiated themselves into his company. And when the opportunity presented itself, they murdered the King of Jerusalem, Conrad of Montferrat. One force that arguably bested the assassins was the Knights Templar. You remember the order of warrior monks that some thought were actually modelled on the assassins. They actually forced the cult to pay them tribute, and there seems to have been a kind of mutual respect at times between them. It's little surprise then that in our modern day, the video game Assassin's Creed is based on the idea of an eternal struggle between the assassins and the Knights Templar. And then there's the Faceless Men, a killer cult in the TV series Game of Thrones and the novels, of course, by George R. R. Martin. And they are based in a large part on the assassins. And then, of course, in the Batman comics and franchise, the League of Assassins is supposed to be an offshoot of the original assassins led by the DC Comics supervillain Ra's al Ghul. And one more fictional take on the assassins. Why not? Of course, Dan Brown has a character who is a descendant of the assassins in his novel Angels and Demons. It was actually at the hands of the Mongolians, the Mongol armies, that the assassins were eventually decisively defeated. In the 13th century, armies from what is now Mongolia and China overran the Middle East, a really quite spectacular invasion, and they managed to take the assassin stronghold of Alamut and kill the then old man of the mountain. The Mongol leader who dealt this death blow was the grandson of Genghis Khan, Hulagu Khan. And with his action, with his destruction of the assassins, the cult faded into the history books. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed that look at the terrorist medieval cult known as the Assassins. Next time, I'm going to the early 17th century to look at the gunpowder plotters who tried to blow up King James I of England and all of Parliament. Now, were they terrorists? Well, we'll find out in the next episode. Until then, goodbye for now. Oh, <laughs>